everyone, I'm Manus Peters and I'm a senior lecturer at Newcastle University. And in this talk today, I'm going to talk about how we can draw inspiration from nature, so using biomimetics, to develop new nanoscale materials that can be used both for sensing and for drug delivery. And what I'll also do at the end, I'll give some tips for early career researchers and some things that I've experienced along the way. So I did a PhD in chemical engineering and chemistry at Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, where I really was working on the interface of engineering and chemistry, and I was producing polymers. So based on my research project and in the Netherlands, uh, a master's is actually five years, I wanted to pursue like a PhD project. And that's how I ended up in Hassel University in Belgium where I was producing polymers that were used for medical applications. And what was really important for me is that I wanted to have a PhD project which was applied as well. So having a hospital involved in that particular project was really important for me. Now, after that, I did a short postdoc and then I finally moved to the UK about six years ago. And you can see there that I, I started actually my independent research career at Manchester Metropolitan University. So I've also been involved in uh, the Manchester and District local section uh, as a secretary for the RSC. So it still has a very special place in my heart. Now, this is a, well, a fairly up-to-date picture of my research group in Newcastle University in some better times. And what we really do is make systems uh, particularly polymers that can be used for uh, specific sensing applications. But we also have access to some bespoke um, thermal and electrical sensing strategies. And I will show you some of those. So we've been developing uh, portable thermal devices, which I will show a little video of, which are mainly used to assess water quality. So such as uh, detection of antibiotics or micropollutants. And then we've also been involved with electrical sensors. So having something which is implantable, but also looking at uh, functionalized catheter. So that's more leaning towards the in vivo aspect of what we're doing. And we do this by bio-inspired design. Because when you look at antibodies, so antibodies, it's what we've got in our own body. They're obviously great at detecting foreign invaders. And, and that's why they're often used in amino assays. So they rely on these antibodies for a lot of diagnostics. And what we're not so much aware of is that there is a multitude of problems associated with antibodies. So they tend to have relatively low stability. So looking at different pH values and elevated temperatures. In general, there's quite a high variation in, in per batch. And we also see that a lot of these antibodies are not uh, validated properly. So if you talk about antibodies, uh, there's a lot of waste of resources going in there. And what is a very important aspect of this as well, what people are not that much aware of, is even though we've got recombinant technologies to produce these antibodies, you will see a lot of it still rely on immunization of animals. So that involves using animals and also sacrificing them. And, and this is quite a big problem. It's bigger than you expect, because in the EU alone, one million animals are, are used per year to actually produce these antibodies. So and the way we do this is that we don't mimic the structure of the antibody, but we look at the interactions between the antibody and the antigen. And we know that binding occurs via a range of non-covalent interactions. And we can mimic these amino acids with some monomers or some polymers. But the benefit that we have is that we're not limited to the natural uh, occurring amino acids. So it's only about 20 of them. In principle, we should have an infinite library of resources available that we can work with and can really use computational modeling tools to work out which monomers would be very good at binding specific antigens. And uh, the particular technique that we are using for this are molecularly imprinted polymers or short MIPS. And here you can, can see in the image how this uh, works more or less. So we've got something that we detect and we have that or something that resembles that particular target that we want to look at and we assemble some monomers around it uh, and then they form a, a complex based on these non-covalent interactions. Now then we polymerize them in, in the presence of crosslinker monomers and then after the polymerization is complete we extract them from our matrix. So we would have particular monomers that can selectively recognize the targets afterwards so this is a combination of size, shape, but also chemical functionalities. And then the 3D matrix is really the polymer structure that gives these binding sites actually the rigidity or the stability in order to remain intact. So what we're really looking for is, can we produce polymer that have similar affinities uh, to antibodies, 
but are, have these additional advantages in terms of low cost, more robust, mass production, not using animals. And when I started working with this during my PhD, I was working on microparticles and these microparticles were deposited onto surfaces. So here you can see binding increases the, the, the impedance, so that's the, the Z, that's what it stands for, it's a, and increases the electrical resistance. And by monitoring the electrical resistance, we can actually determine how much of the target is present. Now, what was quite unique then, and I will show you what this device looked like, is that we showed that this could be applied not just to the electrical resistance, but also the heat flow at the interface was altered. And the first thing I did when I started my independent research career was producing these sensors in collaboration with Professor Banks at Manchester Metropolitan University, uh, on larger scale by directly incorporating these particles into screen printing ink. But unfortunately, microparticles just don't have the affinity that we want and therefore they can't compete necessarily with antibodies. So what we need to do is to move towards nanosystems. And here we are working with MIP Diagnostics, the company I mentioned before, where they use a solid phase approach to produce nanoparticles. And the way it works, if you look at the schematic, is that you attach them, uh, whatever you want to detect, such as a protein onto a, a solid glass bead, and then you polymerize around it. So rather than extracting your target, we were actually extracting the polymer. So this allowed an additional purification step to make sure that we had only the polymers with really high affinity. And what we did in our research, we functionalized these onto thermocouples. And we, we showed that likewise, like you saw with the electrical resistance, once we had binding to them, we actually saw a reduction in the heat flow, so an increase in the resistance. And in this case, you could just look at the temperature that it was monitoring. And we applied this for a range of larger molecules, such as proteins, but also for smaller molecules, such as antibiotics. And by swapping out the polymer material with a different cartridge, you can target other materials. Now, this is obviously a schematic. Uh, I can show you what it actually looks like in the lab, which is uh, slightly different. So these are all homemade devices. It is patented technology where we measure the temperature, but also we can control the temperature and we can even measure the impedance or the electrical resistance at the same time if we wanted to. So we have a flow cell. So in the flow cell, this is actually where the recognition happens because in the flow cell, you see that later on, this is where we actually insert our polymer electrodes. All the rest is just a way of measuring the temperature within that flow cell. Now this really relates to, you can use antibodies, but you can also use nano MIPS. And here you can see a TEM image of what that looks like. And when we were doing this project, we looked at a number of different cardiac biomarkers. So besides troponin, which is the main uh, cardiac biomarker, which is used to indicate whether you have a heart attack. And we functionalized them onto the surfaces using different strategies. And we were combining both the results that we were getting using antibodies but also with the particles to see what works best. Now, so here I'm going to show you some of the initial results, but we should have a paper coming out on this particular one soon. And we integrated these nanoparticles onto the screen printed electrodes, which are disposable and therefore really low cost electrodes. And we looked at different strategies in order to get them on the surface. Now, the key thing you need to see here is that we were able to measure three different electrodes at the same time. So we have the cardiac biomarker troponin in red, which is what we're really after. Then we have in blue heart fatty acid binding protein, which is a similar cardiac biomarker. And then we also have a blank in order to have like a direct reference for our results. And what you are seeing, and this is relates to the thermal resistance, is that only when you've got the nanoparticles there designed for the troponin and when increasing the troponin concentration, only those actually increase in signal. So you can see it's very reliable because you can measure three things at the same time. And more importantly, we can also look at physiologically relevant concentrations. So we can go to concentrations as low as a nanomolar. And this was done in buffered solution, but we've also looked before at, for instance, spiked blood samples. But in a few months, we'll also have a Marie Curie project starting where we are going to look at drug delivery. And we look at improving the drug delivery for uh, anti-cancer agents. 
because they have a lot of side effects. And by using the polymers to make the binding really selective, we can reduce this number of side effects. And here we're going to make use of something quite unique of these polymers. And that's that we can imprint with one thing, which may be good enough, but we can do dual imprinting. So imprinting of two targets. And that makes it a lot more interesting because it gives you new opportunities. So you can make an imprint for a particular receptor. So in this case, we would look at particular receptors for breast cancer. And then you can also imprint them at a particular drug compound. Yes. So we would like to see if we can use our thermal analysis technique to in real time monitor what's happening. Can we first of all monitor the attachment? But once the drugs are being released, can we also monitor in vivo, in real time, what's actually happening? Are the cells, are they dying? How fast are they dying? So it gives you a lot more information and it would be quite quick. Aspect. Another interesting thing we could look at is here you can see these imprints and here you can actually see the nicely size and shape. You can apply them to bacteria. So we, uh, we've looked at E. coli, which you can see on the left, look at Staph aureus. So it would be interesting to look at different bacteria as well into particular samples. So what are some of the conclusions from this? So I would say that MIPS, and when it comes to affinity, they are really an interesting alternative to antibodies. They're low cost, they're versatile, you can apply them to lots of different things. And by functionalizing them with certain functionality, such as uh, fluorescent moieties, you can really use a range of characterization techniques. So the example I've shown here, this is mainly focused on this thermoelectric sensing where we, we looked at these cardiac biomarkers, but there's really a wide scope to apply this to other applications and do get in touch with us if you've got any ideas, whether this relates to the drug delivery, whether it relates to some kind of array format. And we are particularly interested in the future to expand this to cancer biomarkers. Now, Finally, and, and this is actually also very important here, you've seen some of my journey throughout uh, how I've actually worked at different universities. And even though it looks really smooth on paper, it's never quite like that. So the tips I would give you in order you know, to have that flexibility is to, to first of all, expand your network. It's so important, even during your PhD, and I didn't realize that that much, to, to go to, to conferences, whether they are online, uh, to go to networking uh, events, because when you just start, you really need that collaboration around you in order to get new ideas, but also to get more work done. Uh, because in the end, you know how long it is to write like a paper. And if you've got other people kind of pushing you, it really helps to, to also bring new techniques to the table, but also that kind of support network when things are not going the way you intended to, or not as they were planned, then it really helps to have supportive people around you. And besides that, I, I, I think like what I try to tell my students now, take the most out of the training opportunities that you've got. Because in the end, lots of people like you, if you, if you are looking at an academic career, they would have very high impact papers. They would have lots of papers. So it is important what other skills you can bring to the table. So whether this is being really good at presentations so as pitching or writing grants as yourself, and particularly when you're a postdoc, there are lots of very small bursaries, particularly from the Royal Society of Chemistry, that you can try. And that really makes you stand out and show that you've got your own independent ideas. And with all of that, what I was saying, like, it is important to push yourself outside your comfort zone. So, for instance, when I uh, was doing this postdoc in London, I was initially thinking of applying for another postdoc position until other people persuaded me to try and go for a lectureship with uh, my CV. And I didn't really feel comfortable doing that, but it did uh, land me my first academic position. So it is important to have people around you that support you and actually tell you, uh, you know, to go for these opportunities and to try it. 